All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us once again. So, uh, yep, uh, let's begin. All right. So, uh, we have our, our, our guest today who will be speaking, um, all of whom are very established in the scene. And uh, I will be introducing them and they will be sharing more about themselves and their experiences later on. But before that, uh, I will have to be in between you and hearing from them because, uh, yep, this is an entrepreneur. This session is brought to you by the entrepreneurship department. So we would like to share some of our programs that we have prepared for the students here. Right, so uh, I understand that some of the students here, you are here to actually fulfill your pre w entrepreneur mindset and at the same time learn something. So if you're here for that, uh, you will have to stay through the entire session. There will be a quiz after that for you to fill in and your attendance will be updated only if you signed up on Simplicity, you stayed throughout and also you completed the quiz. Right, so let me begin. So uh, looking at this timeline here, so this is actually the entrepreneurship programs that we have. So we focus on programs from uh, pre-ideation all the way to traction and, and uh, fundraising stage after, right? So in the pre-ideation stage, uh, this is one of the program that you, uh, you, you are attending now, right? So this from idea to startup, we call it a fits in short. So this is the pre-ideation stage, uh, helping you to develop your entrepreneur mindset. If you happen to hear from the speakers, it sparked you, you want to do something, you can feel free to let us know and we will help you on that. All right, the next program that I would like to quickly share as well is uh, the Impact Startup Challenge. So this is, uh, you can take it as a five credit bearing course, or if you would prefer, you can actually take it as non-credit bearing as well. All right, so um, let me cover this uh, in a short while. We, I have another slide prepared for this. And I would like to share also another key program of, from us. So this is the Alibaba Cloud SUSS Entrepreneurship uh, Program, right? So you can actually take this as a minor or a certificate in entrepreneurship, right? But that's provided if you pass the program before you graduate, then you can take it as a minor, right? So I, I always like to tell students, this is the easiest minor that I have personally seen, right? Because you just have to, Page to be part of the program, you get assessed into the resources, into the mentors, and um, you get the, the support that you need to, to be start, right? And uh, in order to pass, you will just have to pitch during the demo day. So there will be investors present as well. So you can pitch to them, try to raise some funds there, right? So that is one of the requirements. Another requirement would be uh, for you to uh, uh, raise any amount of funding, either private or public uh, funding, even the Start SG Founder Grant, which SUSS is an AMT for, so we can actually recommend you for the grant of 50K, $50,000, right? If you think that raising uh, funds is not the pathway that you want to go towards, you want to do a revenue generating one uh, path instead, there is another option for you to actually uh, earn an annual revenue of $250,000 in annual revenue. And that would fulfill the same criteria for uh, passing off this program, right? So if there is anything that you wish to clarify, you want to learn or know more, feel free to uh, reach out to us through that email, right? Or you can just uh, post it in the chat. Uh, if, I'm, if we have some time later, I'll just uh, get back to you on that. All right, so uh, I would like to touch on this uh, Impact Startup Challenge, right, CDO 303 ACI. So I understand that uh, ECR has already passed, right? So uh, not to worry, if you still, this is your first time hearing it, this interests you after I explain later, feel free to scan the QR code at the top right-hand corner. You can apply it, I can uh, do some magic for you and uh, I'll be in touch with you after your application on this uh, QR code. Right, so what is this Impact Startup Challenge? This is actually a six days bootcamp, right? So uh, it, it helps you to uh, meet people, to uh, ideate, to validate your problem. So th this whole uh, six days is very focused on the Lean Startup methodology, right? So finding your customer problem fit, finding your solution fit, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and this is actually the inaugural run that we, we are doing right, uh, ASEAN-China Impact Startup Challenge. 
we bring together partners uh, and attend this from 10 different ASEAN China cities together. So you will have the chance to work with them, uh, talk to them, and they might be your potential co-founder, right? Uh, at the end of the six days, the last activities that you will have to do is actually to pitch, right? Put together what you have done, what you have validated, pitch to a panel of investors or, or uh, entrepreneurs themselves, right? So you have a feel of what the industry is and how it is like, right? So we have a lot of students and teams who, who actually started something because of this uh, impact startup challenge as well. Okay, so uh, I'm going to leave this screen here for a while. If you're interested, feel free to uh, scan the QR code or just uh, type in the uh, bit.ly address at the bottom as well for more information, right? So same thing, if you have any questions regarding this, uh, feel free to drop us an email at entrepreneurship at suss.edu.sg. All right, so uh, without much, or without further ado, let me uh, hand over the time to the team from Ripple to Wave, right? Good. So I guess it's fast to start, right? Right. Over to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me well. Hello, everyone from Switzerland. I'm Helge. I'm based in Zurich, Switzerland. I'm going to kick off the session that we have scheduled here uh, by introducing you to uh, what we all link to, the Ripple to Wave incubator. Um, and with that, as part of it, every one of uh, my team members that is on this call will also get a chance to introduce themselves. Maybe just quickly about myself. As I said, I'm Helge, I'm based in, in Zurich. Uh, by academic background, I'm an, I'm an engineer. I did a master's in civil engineering then did a PhD in environmental engineering. Uh, I am German by origin, lived most of my past years here in, in Zurich, but also some years in Toronto, Canada, and up till recently traveled very often to Singapore. Not, not any longer currently, but hopefully soon again. Um, about a year ago, we launched this incubator, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about that one and introduce myself further also as, as part of um, uh, the team introductions that we do later. So I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, Ripple to Wave Incubator, we're here to build emerging water technology leaders in Singapore. Uh, I, we started in May, 2019. Uh, we are a joint venture between uh, a company that I work for, Emerald Technology Ventures, and a little bit later, I tell you more about us, and BFT Ventures, uh, you will hear about uh, them as well. And we are supported by Enterprise Singapore and by PUB, uh, Singapore's National Water Agency. Basically, it is our existence is linked to the goal of Singapore trying to become a global water tech hub. Um, as you may know, there has been a lot of investment going into the research activities related to water, almost 700 million in the time frame of 15 years. Um, and um, yeah, with strong support by PUB, EDB, and the National Research Foundation. And we're basically here to take some of the generated IP and convert it to hopefully um, some successful commercial traction. Uh, for that reason, uh, we decided to form this joint venture with different backgrounds. You already see here on a geographic map uh, what sort of an emerald on a geographical basis and the VFT bring to the table. Emerald being um, a 20-year venture capital uh, player in, on, the, on the global scale, but really more in North America and Europe with a recent presence being established in Singapore and BFT Ventures being more of a local player in Singapore with uh, strong connections to Chinese, to the Chinese market, but also other uh, Southeast Asian markets. 
to share a little bit more detail about us, why do why we think that we are a winning combination of executing and building these uh, these startups um, on the Emerald front. It is, as I said, because we have a 20 year history in, in clean tech. We have deep in-house tech and market expertise. We have intimate access to global corporate investors that uh, jointly uh, reach about or reach more than 500 billion in combined annual revenues. We at Emerald also generated successful exits in the water space, selling companies to BSF, Xylem, and Suez. And just recently, actually closed a dedicated uh, water fund of 100 million with uh, Temasek as a cornerstone investor. While VFT Ventures, as I said, um, has uh, the local connections and the local know how, what you actually need to incubate companies. They know the in Singaporean ecosystem. Um, they successfully penetrated with their startups Asian markets. They have local water and non-water startup and incubation experience and have very strong ties to local stakeholders. That's why we think we're a, we're a winning combination. And um, yeah, part of being a winning, winning team is obviously having team members. Uh, it's one one element of being um, impressive in terms of expertise, but you also need the actual capacity to execute on, on the incubation activities that we have. So with that, why don't I hand it over first to Jeremy to introduce himself, then I follow and then pass it on to my colleagues. Jeremy? Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Jeremy here. So basically my background, I graduated from NUS with an engineering degree. I also did my MBA in NTU. Uh, over the years, uh, I've been involved in various uh, MNCs as well as research centers. Uh, I'm also the co-founder and director of uh, two startups. One is uh, Drake Analytics and the other one is uh, XJR Labs. So Drake Analytics is more a company that's more in, related in the water water industry. And uh, VFT Ventures, which Emerald with uh, Helga mentioned earlier, is the kind of holding company of uh, Drake Analytics. So together with Emerald, we started also this uh, people to way as well as uh, for VFT, we also have a seed investment fund called Millennial VFT, uh, which does investment into seed companies. So basically our idea is really to build the entire value chain from the incubator to the seed, invest, to seed investment fund, as well as an operating company to help to bring the startups uh, out to the out to the market, yeah. Okay, maybe next will be uh, Swimming. Yeah. Well, I keep I keep going. Let's go through the through the line. I okay. partly introduced myself already with my academic background. Fifteen years at Emerald, always responsible for the water sector, um, which means that um, yeah, I I uh, define our strategy, but I also sit on boards of these companies. Uh, Prior to that, obviously, lead the investment processes. And as part of that, I also, together with Jer Jeremy, co-founded this, this incubator in Singapore. Um, next on the list, uh, unfortunately not present in this call, is our colleague, uh, Catherine Yu, uh, Associate Director. She has a similar background to myself, actually. Um, she did a PhD in environmental engineering as well, with a focus on uh, membrane science. Um, so she and after that worked for a company called Semcorp, um, did a lot of uh, troubleshooting and technology analysis for them, and was also involved in technology transfer between Singapore and China. That's Catherine. So over to Siming, followed by Abel. Uh, hi everyone. So I'm Siming over here. I graduated from SMU about ten years ago, um, twenty eleven. So incorporated the company in 2010. So altogether about 10 years uh, of experience as an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, I joined Ripple the Wave in January this year. So trying to provide the experience of uh, being a bootstrapping entrepreneur, coming from a fresh grad background, and then uh, building my company, and then leveraging on the several government policies that's in place, and how you actually take a uh, A-star technology from a research IP all the way into the market. So later on, I'll be sharing more about my experience altogether. So you can hear from me later on more about it. Yeah. 
So I'll pass to you, Ibel. Thank you, Suning. Hi, everyone. I'm Ibel. So I'm the new additional to the People to Wave family. Uh, I just graduated from my master's from NTU doing techno entrepreneurship and innovation. So here I am at Ripple to Wave doing whatever I can to support our incubators and all the initiatives by the incubator. Um, back to you, Helga. Thank you, Ibel. Um, so my last slide is just giving you an idea of the kind of companies that we're currently incubating. Uh, you see six examples here. One of them, we're actually still in the sign-up phase, but it's really just to give you a flavor. Um, uh, some of them, if you look at the left side, are related to um, real-time or quick detection of contamination in water, Backsense and Ecosense. Then you have in the middle top, you have um, a, basically a chemical approach, a catalyst approach to treat very harsh and toxic industrial wastewaters. Then on the left, both companies offer membrane-based solutions, which is basically like a mechanical way to filter out particles out of, out of water to keep it simple for your understanding. And in the, in the middle at the bottom, it's data crew, which represents sort of a digital water theme. In this case, it's about secure um, uh, communication uh, to be used in digital monitoring uh, and the automation of water systems. And that's already it uh, as an in initial introduction. So we will now actually go into more of the individual backgrounds of us. Um, Jeremy will share sort of the journey of Sweek, a startup. Uh, then Siming already indicated he will share his story with you. I will then give you a little bit more background on Emerald Technology Ventures as well, so you understand our background that we try to bring to the table in Singapore. And then we finish with a bell uh, mapping out a program, a digital water program that we're just about to embark on uh, together with SUSS. And that is closely linked to what this session is all about. Um, and that will be then basically the, the final aspect of what we want to cover. And there will be time for Q&A after that as well. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Jeremy, you're next, right? can see your screen, but we cannot see you yet. You seem to have turned off your camera. Yeah, trying to figure out how do I turn off camera. Oh, there you go. Yeah, hi everyone. So let me put this into presentation mode. Yeah, hi. So yeah, today I'll share a bit more about uh, Drake Analytics. As I mentioned earlier, uh, although I'm involved in a couple of companies, Drick is more related to the water space. And therefore, I'll share a bit about our journey in uh, how we develop the world fish, the fish biomonitoring systems. But where it all begins? Actually, biomonitoring monitoring is not new. Uh, it's always been used in uh, by the utilities in monitoring the quality of water. Uh, besides, for biomonitoring, monitoring, right, there are different kinds of... Uh, biomonitors of which we have like uh, bacteria, you have like uh, algae, you have clams, and now uh, you have fish. Now fish is normally the kind of one that's more easily accessible because it's easier to kind of breed and uh, get access to the fish. And they are also uh, very similar. I mean, what, what we do is we choose the fish that is very uh, similar to the human being so that whatever affects the human will also affect the fish. Uh, so that uh, the fish kind of serve as the first layer of uh, sensor to detect the, uh, the presence of chemicals and contaminants. And they will be able to like kind of trigger and alert by uh, to like uh, some behavioral patterns or like uh, just dying uh, when they encounter these chemicals. So as I mentioned, uh, bio, bio monitor, monitoring is actually not new, uh, just that before that, it had been a very tedious and uh, very troublesome process because what the util utilities do is that they have to pipe the water from the reservoirs all the way to like maybe a central command, command center where the water goes into various fish tank and you have one person or a few, a few people monitoring 
uh, the behavior of fish in all these fish tanks. Now, this can become something that's very tedious and uh, very cumbersome and uh, when you're human involved, sometimes there may be misdetection. So therein, uh, that's where DRIP came up. So we've been, uh, DRIP actually is a spin-off from A-Star. Uh, what happened was that we actually worked with PUB while we were in A-Star. So PUB had identified this pain point where they were using fish for detection of water, but they find that uh, it's very cumbersome and they were looking for some ways to automate the process. So uh, while at A-Star, so A-Star worked with PUB to develop a solution using video analytics to uh, kind of monitor the behavior of fish in a fish tank. And uh, in 2011, Drip was born out of this uh, collaboration. So just a snapshot of uh, the equipment itself. So basically what we have is uh, we have the we, we have the fish in a fish tank in this equipment over here. So they have a, a video camera that monitor the behavior of the fish. Now water is piped from the reservoir into the fish tank on a continuous basis. And uh, the system is able to trigger alerts should there be certain abnormal behavior of the fish, like swimming to the surface, moving erratically, swimming to the edge of the fish tank, or just swimming around very rapidly. So this kind of snapshot of the different generation of the product. So it started with, in fact, even before this, it's a very rudimentary product where we're using more like a cupboard, cupboard to cupboard to kind of uh, put the fish tank in. And then we kind of improve it to the blue one and moving on to the current uh, shape and form of the equipment. Uh, our awards, so basically over the years, we have uh, kind of gathered various recognition. Uh, we, got, we were the winner of the Emerging Enterprise Award as well as the Best Innovation Award in 2015. We are also one of the four companies that made the cut for the Clean Tech Group for the APEC 25. So our customers and associates, so basically we have uh, over the years reached out to customers in different countries, uh, in Singapore, in Malaysia, China, Taiwan, uh, Middle East, Australia, and even have a collaboration with EPA in uh, the US. Our global footprint, well, I just mentioned that earlier. So currently there are more than like 76 units deployed in Singapore and Malaysia across 30 sites. And uh, beyond Singapore, we also started to venture overseas. So in China, we are working with the Yangtze River uh, Commission, where we have a kind of research collaboration to do research into uh, the type of fish to be used in China, as well as deployment of a couple of units over there. In Taiwan, uh, same thing for monitoring of raw, raw water. Uh, for this, it's slightly different because we are taking water from the river, which is kind of uh, a bit dirtier. So we have to have a pre-treatment system that helps to clean up the water. And uh, in Australia, where we currently have two units being tested, uh, so this is actually happening in uh, Melbourne, in Australia. So some of the some of the learnings from our journey, like I mean, doing a startup is uh, actually not a very simple thing. Uh, well, I mean to do it. I think the first thing, the first really key thing to what we have learned so far is to really identify the pain point. In this case, the pain point was, of course, that uh, it's a very manual and tedious process in trying to monitor uh, the behavior of fish. And therefore, we're looking for a solution to automate the entire process. Now, another very important thing when we start out is really to find an anchor customer or partner. Uh, in this case, we are very fortunate that we have a PUB who is actually very open to uh, trying out new new innovation and new technology, and in fact, work very closely with us to uh, develop this solution. Uh, similarly, when we go overseas, in each of these countries, we actually also work with uh, key partners. So like, we don't just go there and start marketing to everyone, but wherever we go, we try to work with our uh, key partners so that uh, we can kind of uh, understand the local environment and also to slowly uh, work with some partner to penetrate the market. Uh, well, I mean, the third point I have is really to diversify the customer. So for us, I mean, especially for people in the water industry, if you're in Singapore, really PUB is just kind of the main customer. So, and sometimes PUB, well, although they are very helpful and very open, sometimes it takes quite some, quite a long time for them to kind of roll out a tender project for us to go in. So therefore, while waiting, like, we actually make the, we actually took, a, in, took the decision to go overseas. So actually from Singapore, we actually went straight to China to start the collaboration to Yangtze River site. And that actually helped 
our company to move uh, faster so that when the few weeks tender came along, we are kind of more or less ready and uh, we managed to roll out through the whole thing. Uh, the fourth point I'd like to share is more of the team composition. So when we start out on the team, it's always very important. I mean, of course, you always say that, oh, friends coming together, let's start a company. But then uh, it's not as simple as just starting up code. It's, the, it's a, actually a process. So a lot of times, uh, the chemistry among the team is very important. And also that you must try to have a kind of variety of uh, different skill sets of the team. Like for us, we have one business, we have some technical people. In fact, we have two technical people when we first started out. We have one business, we have one uh, kind of administrative kind of the grant related person. And we have some people, uh, another one who has been to overseas. So it's kind of a varied team composition that uh, help to provide a well-rounded, uh, that bring to the table different capabilities. And the fifth point, I think, I mean, a lot, of us, a lot of us don't like to talk about it, but I think the equity kind of thing is very important because along the way, in fact, from my experience, for the different startup that I've been involved in, a lot of times, the original founding team will change. So like, uh, when Drake started out, we actually had five original founders. In fact, right now, there's only uh, two person that's still around. The other three is actually uh, went off for uh, to, to, to do that, to do other things. And therefore, actually, it's also important because if someone were to hold quite a significant equity company and if he were to leave uh, and he still hold to the stake, actually, this will create a lot of problems uh, for the startup uh, in terms of investment, in terms of like uh, finding, finding VC to invest in it, and also in terms of like the remaining members may not be happy because they're actually working uh, and should they be successful, the one who departed who still hold to the share will actually benefit from it. Uh, yeah, so therefore, it's always good to have some form of kind of uh, agreement where you can't say, oh, if one person depart, he will probably hold on to some small share of it, but he will kind of sell off the rest back to the company at, uh, at cost or at a certain price to be decided on. And the last thing is like, uh, well, startup always sounds very glamorous, but actually it's a very long journey. I mean, every startup that I have, it's like, have been more than for Drake, it's been nearly nine years and uh, to go to where we are today. My other company, Astra, is almost seven years uh, to kind of reach revenue of a couple of million. So it's kind of, do not expect, of course, there'll be some success story where uh, startups become very successful in a matter of a couple of years. But I would say that in most cases, it's a pretty much a uh, long journey that you have to be prepared to sit down and uh, roll out your sleeve and grind your way through. Yeah, and that's kind of a quick overview of what I have for Drake Analytics. Thank you. So maybe I'll stop sharing and hand over to uh, Suming. Okay, all right. Hi, everyone. Just a quick check. Can you all see my screen as well? All right, right? Okay. Yeah, so before I start, um, just wanted to share with you, I'm going to approach this from an angle of a founder coming from a fresh grad background, fresh graduate, that means I just graduated. And I'm going to share with you the journey I've undertaken for the past 10 years and the things that I learned and see. Okay, and uh, this is because of the fact that I actually, after 10 years already, and I'm looking backwards. So I think just wanted to show you this, uh, this quote from Steve Jobs as well. You can't really connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Okay. Over here, um, I think I will be asking some questions. Would appreciate if you all can actually um, reply to me as well. Not so sure because a lot of you are hiding behind the camera as well. So don't know whether all of you are still there. Are you all still there? Hello. Can I see some? Nope. Okay, um, so, yeah, so before I start, I just wanted to ask you all some questions as well. Okay, because you will be into the cross route where you have to choose whether you want to become an entrepreneur or you decide to move on to the corporate career pathway. And my first question to you will be that, what will be the economic outlook in Singapore in the next 10 years as well? And what do you foresee will be some of the changes that will be 
that will be moving ahead. Okay, this is actually one of the questions that I also asked myself back then, 10 years ago. In 2009, I incorporated a company in 2010 as well. Yeah. So any of you would like to share with me some of the economic outlook that you think is going to present, be present in Singapore in the next 10 years? Hello? Siming, I think they're responding in the chat. So I see some replies. Okay. Uh, Smart City, IoT. Smart City. Uh, from Adam. Okay. Uh, Iliko says Smart Singapore, exclamation mark. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Uh, Nicole says uh, a lot of uh, AI being involved. AI being involved, all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Melissa says big data, AI, big data. good answers. Okay. Are there more? Mm, not at the moment, yeah. Um, how about, do you foresee there's an uh, easier way for you to secure jobs also? Do you foresee that you're going to secure a long-term job employment and stuff like that as well? Or it's better to be an entrepreneur? Are the chats coming in as well? Yeah. Uh, so your question is whether, uh, Siming's question is whether you foresee uh, that there will still be you know, jobs, right? Or would it be better to be an entrepreneur? Maybe by a show of hands, how many of you feel that uh, you'll be better in such an economic outlook to be an entrepreneur? Maybe you can just indicate with a thumbs up. Yeah, okay. I can hopefully try to see the chat as well. Yeah, so we have a few responses. Um, Jing Lun says uh, he foresees jobs loss to automation. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, Iliko says, I think it depends on the kind of skills that one has. Mm -hmm. uh, while Hannah says, I think it depends on the field that you're in. Uh, both mm -hmm. are true, right? If your field uh, and your skills are, are kind of Still in demand, then probably uh, there will still be work and employment options. Jing Kang says, I think both are still rather attractive options at this point. So mm -hmm. he's uh, open to both. Okay, so um, let me share with you what I, what I actually uh, deduced back then in 2009. Okay, uh, I came from a background where my father was retrenched. He was an electrical engineer from Philips, okay? And he was uh, supporting the family. And that was during my JC days itself. Yeah, and by the time I reached NS, I was thinking, uh, when, what kind of a career pathway do I want? And uh, by then, will I face the same dilemma and same uh, set of issues that he might be facing as well? So those are some of the key things that I went through. And I actually took uh, economics from my A-level and did pretty well and understand the macroeconomic overview as well as the micro uh, demand and supply and stuff like that. Okay, and my back then I was thinking about, okay, what would happen to Singapore if more MNCs actually start shifting their bases out from Singapore, which as a result causes my father retrenchment as well, right? And then uh, will that happen to me as well? Do I still want to take on an uh, electrical, electrical engineer uh, pathway? That means I go through the engineering school in NUS or NTU, or would I want to find another alternative uh, pathway out? Okay, so eventually I chose uh, SMU for business management. Okay, the idea is that uh, I get a general degree, and then uh, I believe that people would want to hire uh, general managers, uh, people would like, want to hire people who is good in marketing and finance and all businesses actually needed people with these kind of skill sets, right? 
And the ideal scenario would be that I learn enough uh, understanding and skills. I become an entrepreneur myself so that I can decide my own destiny. Okay, and I think uh, in today's time, right now with the COVID situation and with all the recent news that you start uh, uh, looking at, right? The thing about creating more jobs for PMETs, PMETs are very worried about uh, losses and stuff like that due to automation, due to globalization, the rising uh, workforce from other countries as well. Uh, Singapore becoming a high cost base for a lot of companies. It's harder to, to remain competitive these days and stuff like that, right? Um, these are all real trends that's happening and there are people who actually uh, is having a hard time to find jobs as well. And I think looking back, uh, I did make a right choice. In fact, um, well, I actually secured a job with Ripper to wave right? In January this year as well. So while still running my own company. Yeah, so I think increasingly there's also a new set of uh, skill sets that people are looking for. They are looking for entrepreneurial skill sets, people who can actually think on the foot, think on the ground, and then be able to make decisions like an entrepreneur and be able to execute things for the company as well. So I think those skill sets are becoming more and more relevant and I'm very glad that I have took the entrepreneurial pathway. And I believe in the next 10 years with all the trends that y'all have mentioned just now, like things like artificial intelligence, automation, data analytics, and then uh, with all the globalization that's also going on, even though there's actually some, uh, some discussion going on whether globalization did actually helps the world overall. Uh, but I believe that globalization is a force that cannot be stopped as well. So what it means is that it's going to become more and more competitive. And in this situation right now, because we are also having this Zoom conference, right? You realize that work can be done, not just in Singapore, your competitor can be somewhere overseas as well. Okay, and they can still complete the same kind of work, sending their work over through digitally and be able to hold meetings digitally as well. And they could be somewhere in Hawaii, they could be somewhere in Bali, they could be in Indonesia, they could be in China, they could be in Thailand as well, they could be in US. And because of this very highly globalized and interconnected world, your kind of competition is going to become even more competitive as well. So I believe it might be worthwhile to actually uh, look at entrepreneurship as an alternative career pathway. In fact, if you are young enough, uh, you are able to take on more risks as well. Okay, so that move on to my next slide. Okay, so uh, the next decision that I, I have to actually look through is, uh, for example, this is the rich debt, poor debt, the income statement and balance sheet, right? Okay, so you have to actually take into consideration your monthly expenses. What is your current income or savings you have? Okay, and then moving forward, if you decide to take on the entrepreneurial pathway, how long will be your runway to survive through? Okay, um, just a quick understanding from, from um, everyone. What is your current monthly expenses right now that you are, are having? An estimation between 500 to 1,000, 1,000 to 2,000. Anybody above 2,000 already as a student? Sorry, I can't see the screen, so I, I don't know whether it's that, if there's any chat that's coming in as well. Yeah, so uh, we have about 500 plus minus. I think it's also good, right, uh, for everyone to kind of reflect now on your monthly expenses, how much you think you're spending. We have a couple in the range of uh, three to 500. We have about five or six students. Mm -hmm. uh, a rare 1,000. <laughs> but the rest are very shy not to review right now. <laughs> uh, we see 400 plus plus, 400 plus, 400 plus plus plus. So <laughs> kind of varies, but it's uh, mainly within the range of, I guess, three to 500, right? Most people, yeah. 
Okay, uh, I would say it's actually very good that if you have actually less than 500 kind of uh, expenses right now, and that uh, if you decide to become an entrepreneur, I think the one of the key thing is how can you minimize your own personal expenses? Okay, and if you have got savings, let's say for example, 10K or 20K, that will translate to a amount of runway that you will have. Okay, if let's say it's 10K, and if you have $500 uh, expenses, that's about 20 months as an entrepreneur, assuming there's no income coming in, which you will have to actually take into consideration as well. Okay, and for the guys, if you have been through NS, you will actually, uh, I hope you have actually saved up a bit of money through NS as well. And that helps you to lengthen your runway. Okay, so that's actually one of the key consideration as a, as a founder when you decide to do, or as a aspiring entrepreneur before you decide to become an entrepreneur as well. Like how, how long is your personal runway where you can actually afford to take some risks and be able to pursue your business forward, okay? And the key thing is uh, business doesn't come in the form that on the first month or first day you become successful and revenue comes in and therefore you can pay your own salary, right? So the idea about having an understanding of how long is your runway is actually, I would say, quite important. In fact, if you have a, a runway that can last you about two to three years, I think that is kind of quite ideal for you as well. Okay, but that being said, right, um, you may have family responsibilities as well, or your parents may expect you to help them to pay off some family expenses as well. And those are things that you will have to consider on your own situation and case by case basis as well. Yeah. So different people have different level of uh, family expenses and family responsibilities. So for me, I'm slightly uh, more fortunate I don't have to take care too much of my own family expenses because my dad actually has actually provided a significant amount of savings to tide through and he's actually living on his own retirement fund already. Yeah, but for those who has got more family responsibilities to take care, uh, you have to think through about all these things before you take on the, the route to become an entrepreneur because those are real stuff that you have to consider as well. Okay, so I would say this is uh, the two primary factors that uh, you probably have to think through before you make a decision to become an entrepreneur. So far, all right? Okay, I'm gonna move on to my next slide. Okay, so more about my journey. I graduated in 2011, right? So uh, to be, in fact, right, you back then in, in 2011, uh, being an SMU graduate, you can actually get a pretty good high salary, in fact. So to choose to become an entrepreneur is something that I would say people can kind of like say it's a bit uh, ki xiao, you know? Kind of like, hmm, you are kind of crazy. Why would you give up a good corporate career pathway to go into a, a uncertain entrepreneur pathway, right? And then not knowing whether you're going to pay your own salary, not knowing whether you're going to uh, sell your product into the market and being able to, to make a living for yourself or for your family as well, right? So those are the key considerations. And in fact, if you have got your team members beside you, and all of you are still schooling together right now, right? So you might be working on a project, but the problem <coughs> will come when all of you starts graduating and everybody has to start thinking about the crossroad moving ahead. Do I want to become an entrepreneur or should I go into the corporate career pathway to get my monthly salary? Okay, and that's going to become very real, which means that by then, some of your team members may be leaving your team as well. Okay, and that happens to me because in 2010, I incorporated the company in year three, right? So I gathered a group of friends and there was about 14 of us. So I was like, okay, uh, great. In SMU, I need to get some accounting friends. I need to get some law friends. I need to get some information system friends. And I needed to go uh, to my uh, JC colleagues from computer engineering, from NTU, and then went over to NUS and get all my friends to, to say that let's go and build a company together. Okay, so some of them are my juniors. So they are probably in year one or year two as well. 
Okay, but the same decision all comes into place by the time we graduate. And then eventually there was only two of us, two founders that eventually decided let's just make things happen. Okay, and luckily he was a technical co-founder, I was a business co-founder. Okay, so that, that was exactly what happened. And those are very real things that you will be expected to go through as well by the time you graduate, or if you have a team right now that you are thinking of building a business together. Okay, and in 2011, uh, we actually participated in this uh, ASTAR competition as well. Okay, so back then we actually uh, wanted to build a tech company, technology software company, right? Okay, the main reason being uh, all you need is just a laptop and the willingness to code, okay, and then go and sell it. Okay, so you have very low capital outlay, very low uh, other costs, other costs that you need to consider as well. And all you need is just a, a space, an internet connection and a laptop, and then hopefully you can build some products. And obviously we were very much inspired by Steve Jobs, Bill Gates and, and Mark Zuckerberg, right? So all of them are tech entrepreneurs and all, all the media that pins to us is actually all about tech stories as well. So we, we decided, okay, let's just go into the tech space. So the number one question that we asked ourselves was, uh, where is the best place for us to learn about uh, techno, technology or technopreneurship, right? So we all eventually came to this uh, idea that A star okay, is the place where all the science, technology and research is happening in Singapore. That's the place where we should be learning. And by the way, it's, in, it's a government agency. So we, we should be able to go to them and then ask for help and support. Okay, so that's eventually where we discover one of the technology that we are pretty much interested. It's called 3DFM, 3D face modeling technology, where you turn a 2D uh, picture of a frontal of, of a person face itself into a 3D face model. And eventually, by the time we graduated, uh, ASTAR actually hold a hackathon itself. Okay, and we participated, we built a quick prototype. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's impressive prototype, but it was a very quick prototype. But I think what brought us to the winning entry as a champion, right, was the fact that we actually brought the prototype onto the ground, talking to individual potential customers. Hey, would you like to use this if this was fully built up? Okay, and secure the let off intent first. Okay, so we went one way, one uh, much further into it, not just about building a prototype and participating in the competition for pitch. We went out to secure let off intent, which I think sig signifies some level of commercial interest from the actual potential users as well. So I think that that allows us to get the winning entry as the first prize winner. Yeah, so this was my team back then. Okay, and in 2012, we actually got funded under iGEM. Okay, iGEM was actually a program under Interactive Digital Media Program Office from MDA. Okay, and then uh, our incubator was uh, 123 Jumpstart SITF. Okay, SITF has now been rebranded under SG Tech right now. Okay, so, um, yeah, so you can kind of say I, I kind of like seen the entire startup innovation ecosystem, uh, how he has involved for the past 10 years as well. Okay, and um, yeah, we managed to get ourselves iGEM funded. So that was 50K for us. Okay, but that being said, right, uh, iGEM or even now is still a reimbursement uh, thingy. Okay, what it means is the company has to pay first and then you provide the, the necessary documentation you submit to the relevant agencies who then approve it and then uh, once they process it you get your reimbursement of the financial figures okay and so the next problem that we have was cash flow okay has a fresh grab we don't have much uh, savings to even fund the company right okay and how are we going to pay our uh, so-called interns, employees, or suppliers first to build something and then be able to get ourselves reimbursed after that, right? So we're going to face a cash flow issue. Okay, so but some, some of the things uh, that was helpful to us was the fact that our friends who actually uh, went out to, into the corporate world, they got their monthly salary and they know you. 
and they know that uh, you you are really in it for the long haul, okay, and they are willing to to lend them lend you their their savings, okay. Meanwhile, and then it, it wasn't a lot, but uh, getting three k or five k from individual friends every uh from a few friends itself, right? It really did help us to smoothen our cash flow. In fact, uh, in fact, we also got a. Uh, Youth Business Singapore uh, become an entrepreneur for them as a portfolio, and they give us an interest-free loan as well. So that's how we manage our cash flow issues, even though we have got government grants over here. Okay, so government grants uh, don't come free. They expect you to have the milestone first delivered, and then you get reimbursed for that. If you don't deliver the milestones, even if you pay already, um, it doesn't work, and you don't get the reimbursement. So you really need to ensure your milestones are hit and manage your cash flow very well over here. Okay, so in 2013 for us, right, we were just like any other startups, we were also uh, pretty much quite lost. In fact, uh, every now and then you will have different people giving you different opinions and, and mentors, right? So we have the ability to create a 3D avatar over here and people were telling us, why don't you create a virtual try on for eyewear. Look, there are, there are companies like Four Eyes, uh, there are companies that are selling spectacles online and it's doing very well. Okay, but, um, and maybe you want to do something like that as well. So, so we were thinking, okay, um, well, I think maybe we can provide a 3D virtual try on of spectacles. We, we did try. So we went on to Taobao and then uh, buy some spectacles and glasses uh, online. Okay. Obviously, uh, we have another mentor who actually supplied the budget because she was doing some R&D project as well. So she supplied the budget for us to, to pay for the glasses itself. And she was in China as well. So she brought the glasses back for us as well. So we didn't have to pay for the logistics. Okay, but for us, what we did was we built the, the website. We built the marketing materials. We asked people to, to be our model. In fact, I was the photographer for the models as well. So I, I took photos for them, borrowed another friend's camera and stuff like that. And then we, we, we basically built up the entire website and then we provided the technology to do virtual try on for eyewear. Uh, and to our surprise, actually we sell a few spectacles, but it wasn't enough for us to, to make a living out from there. Okay, but with the 3D modeling technology, right? Uh, back then, the, the, there was also a new technological trend. There was a rise in um, 3D printing, okay? And, and we, we kept thinking, okay, what if we can actually 3D print out some figurines or miniatures to celebrate for, for days like, for example, your Valentine's Day, for example, your Mother's Day or your graduation day, stuff like that, right? People would be willing to pay for it. And uh, true enough, actually, there are people who pay for it as well. So, so we actually sold a few figurines. Um, and in fact, I think we, we also did one for uh, NTU president for Bertil Anderson as well. And they actually appreciated much. So um, back then there was this uh, NTU additive manufacturing center. So they were also trying to look for projects over here. So we actually did a, a small project together with them to print out some miniatures figurines and stuff like that. Okay. And, uh, but one thing that really got us uh, very much excited was the fact that uh, look, in e-commerce, people would like to do 3D virtual try-on, okay? And people would like to, to try on stuff first before they make the purchase. So be it a dress, the caps, or the sunglasses or stuff like that, right? People would like to do try-on. And we eventually we narrowed down to two, two questions, two main problems, okay? It's a, it's, it's a visual fit problem, whether this thing looks nice on me, and does it fit me physically is a physical fit issue as well. Okay, but obviously we can't solve the physical fit uh, over here through technology like that, unless we actually take down their body measurements. And that will require another set of technology called depth camera. Okay, back then, 10 years ago, uh, I would say seven to eight years ago, depth camera wasn't even uh, inside any of our mobile phones. But these days, you know, you can use a uh, that camera, you know, the way how the face unlock works, right? For iPhones and stuff like that, it's using depth sensing as well. Okay, so, so there are technology changes along the way that, that back then just wasn't uh, economical enough for us to invest in that as well. Okay, so there was, this entire was a lot of uh, trial and error, but while we refine our technology for 3D virtual trial and stuff like that. 
Okay. In 2014, uh, basically our iGen grant runs out already. And if we want to continue building the company, uh, the only way for us to survive is to build a product that people are willing to pay for. Okay, and eventually we kind of like say that, uh, look, we still want to pursue the 3D virtual trial on. So um, can we bring this to a hair salon and see if they are willing to pay for it as well? So building an app on the app store um, doesn't really help us to create much revenue. So what even if you become the number one app on the app store itself, right? So can you receive much advertising revenue? Maybe not. Um, are people willing to pay purchasing apps online back then? Maybe not as well. So even if you become the number one app on the app store, uh, chances are it's going to be a free app and you get a number of uh, downloads, but maybe you can't pay any bills as well. So we decided to go B2B, we go to the salons. Okay, and eventually we brought the solution to the salons and we asked them to do pilot test trials. Okay, but along the way, the salons are telling us, hey, look, you can actually build impressive technology like that, right? Why don't you help us build our appointment system, our pause system, our CRM system, and inventory management system and stuff like that. It's going to help us in terms of managing our op business operations. It's very important to us. And um, in fact, we are willing to pay even more for this kind of uh, technology if you can actually build that. Okay, and we tell them, we ask them, um, why are you uh, not using the technology out there in the market right now? So uh, in fact, all the technology out there is not user-friendly for them at all. Okay, and by user-friendly, we, okay, so this is where you actually have to take a step back and understand the market, okay? on why uh, they are not using so-called industry software that's available in the market already. Okay, so uh, taking a step back, okay, usually hairdressers are less uh, educated in terms of going through tertiary education. Okay, so the way how they use computers uh, are very different from the way how we use computers. We are used to opening Excel spreadsheets, Microsoft Word document, PowerPoints and stuff like that, right? But for them is, uh, you ask them to look at spreadsheets, deduce some mathematical formula to do their own accounting and stuff like that. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, okay? So that being said, right? So what happened is uh, you have to build it more visually friendly, more touch-based oriented. Okay, and then uh, combining all the different technology out there that back then it was available. So cloud was already available. So the idea was to provide them a software platform where they can use it anytime, anywhere on any device to manage their salon operations and provide a 3D virtual trial of hairstyling experience for their customers to visualize how they can look like before they make the actual haircut. So that was the value proposition that we proposed and it went on. And eventually we did a product launch at Singapore Productivity Center. So that itself is another story on its own. So we actually managed to, to get A star very much uh, coming in to support us in terms of the comms and media engagement efforts for our product launch itself. And uh, Microsoft was our key partner. So, and they were, I, I would say that maybe they were very much uh, impressed by our our persistence in getting into the market and breaking into new markets that nobody have could have expected as well, right? Trying to try to make traditional business to go digital. So, so I think they kind of like it and eventually won the Microsoft Startup Partners Award for that year itself. Okay, and in 2015, our Pi so wanted to try to go Malaysia. So back then there was this uh, magic accelerator program that they were they were sharing with us. And um, it was pretty much interesting. Three months of, uh, of uh, allowance given to you for free, okay? Flight and accommodation given to you for free. All you need to do is uh, make yourself available over there for three months, stay with the group of ASEAN entrepreneurs over there, and then build something and hopefully launch your product into the ASEAN market. So that was uh, something that we thought, okay, as an entrepreneur, it's a very good deal, right? Why don't we just go and try, okay? And we were actually went on to Malaysia, okay? And that's where I started noticing the differences in markets, both in Singapore and Malaysia, 
okay, we will expect our internet connection in Singapore to run very well and it's at an affordable cost to, to us in terms of household. It's also at an affordable cost to, to the SMEs as well, right? Okay, um, it's very different in Malaysia, in fact. So in fact, when you go to KL, in fact, you would think KL is very similar to Singapore. It's actually not, okay? KL, uh, fiber broadband internet speed, right, was actually uh, not very well connected, which means that if you are building a cloud-based application and you rely on internet as a key infrastructure, um, your technology or your product is not going to be super reliable, okay? And by the way, 30 Mbps cost about 300 ringgit back then. Okay, no uh, ordinary SMEs are willing to invest in internet back then as well. So you realize that there's, a, there's a, always a lot of uh, Wi-Fi internet connection issues in Malaysia. I think even if you go to JB these days, uh, not all the malls are very much wired up as well. Okay, so those are some of the key market differences that you eventually notice. Okay, but in 2015, we actually won the SITF Best Innovative R&D Awards as well. And we got ourselves uh, listed as an enhanced ice cream solution under IDA. IDA back then stands for Infocom Development Authority of Singapore. So now it has been merged with uh, MDA, called IMDA already. Okay, and um, it was interesting uh, with all the publicity and media engagement effort, uh, Samsung actually came to look for us because they, they know that we were working on the hair and beauty salon market itself. They were trying to to actually uh, scope out a market entry for their new product called the Samsung mirror display. And eventually they came to us and then we started to have some partnership and support and stuff like that. Okay, so what it means is uh, if you have got some good uh, media engagement and people start talking about you uh, while other people are Googling and searching for, for new entries for their own products, right? They might be looking for you as well. So that's where you want to pay a bit of attention in terms of your of your digital marketing effort. Okay, and in 2016, uh, us being a piloting new sector solution for enhanced ice spring, right? So we we actually went into under the IDA pavilion for SME ICC event. And um, yeah, as you can see, there was a mirror display over there. So we, we tell uh, Samsung, okay, look, we, we want to showcase your mirror display under the IDA pavilion. Will you be able to lend it to us for free? Yeah, and then they actually did that for us. And it was pretty much interesting. We actually have always good uh, relationship with all our salons as well. So on the day itself, uh, what, we, what we knew in the last minute, right, was that uh, there's going to be some media engagement from Channel News Asia coming in to, to find out more about our solution. And uh, at the last minute, we actually asked one of our salon clients to, can you come over, uh, help us to do some sharing about about the product and technology because it's more convincing for you as an end user to, to use it than us sharing it about it ourselves. And yeah, in less than one hour, she came over, took a taxi and helped us to do the sharing. So that's the kind of level of engagement with your partners and customers if you can actually maintain the level of uh, rapport and trust with them. Okay, and by the end of the year itself, right, we were also uh, at the Switch event. So um, it was the first switch and slash event for Singapore and they wanted to make it very impressive and um, so again we use the Samsung mirror display again we asked Samsung can you provide we're going to have a three hairdressing workstation over here and the booth is supported by A star and uh, Minister Teo Chi Hien is going to be the guest of honor can you provide this and we also asked all our salon hairdressers uh, can you send a few hairdressers from each salon Okay, and help us to take appointment in our booth itself and then perform some hairstyling for our, our audiences. And that makes our booth the best booth, I would say the most uh, engaged booth for, for, for the entire event itself. In fact, uh, even up to 6 p.m. when the event closed, people were still queuing up to, to come into, into our booth area as well. Okay, and um, yeah, so in 2016 itself, then there was this uh, China ASEAN uh, entrepreneurship sharing event. We were asked to represent Singapore from Youth Business Singapore. And then, um, yeah, so we went on to, to China. That was in Shanghai itself. And then uh, basically showcase our product and services. So for me, it was more of, I, I wanted to learn about China market itself. So that's the best place for me to talk to the, 
people on the ground and understand what, what is the take and feel of the technology out there. Yeah. Okay, so in 2017, again, uh, went over to Shanghai, but this time around by another group that brought us over there. So it was a Shanghai ice space and they were working with ASTAR. So uh, being an ASTAR startup, we were also being asked to, to invited to go over there. And it was kind of a sponsored trip. So we managed to go over there without uh, incurring much cost on our own, other than our, our own personal expenses and stuff like that. And uh, we did a, a road show as well and showcase our product, but um, yeah, nothing much was achieved in the market in Shanghai, but we got to know quite a bit of stuff of how things works in China. Okay. And by then, um, Enhanced Ice Spring has been rebranded. The initiative has been rebranded under SME Go Digital. Okay, and we were the first uh, few vendors that listed under the program that really helps the SMEs to, to go digital. I think uh, back then the, the key slogan and uh, thing was even traditional businesses like FMB, hawker centers, or even salons, they can and should go digital as well. It's not just for the big companies or for the more advanced companies. Yeah, so that, that's how things are for us. And we also uh, showcase our new project called the Internet of Screens, which is uh, taking another set of uh, ASTAR technology as well, which is doing uh, audience measurement in terms of their emotions and face expression analysis and stuff like that. And then uh, helping to build uh, advertising, uh, interactive advertising engagement and stuff like that. Okay, and we managed to showcase to Minister uh, Ming Sui Kiet. He was the guest of honor for the day itself. And together with Samsung, we held another event called Hairdressing Go Digital. Okay, so you, uh, Samsung was our partner, very much uh, very helpful to us. And they have been uh, very supportive to, to provide us their events, uh, as well as their, their technology showroom, to even their auditorium, and in fact, the FMB, and in fact, the tablets and stuff like that that we needed. So maintaining good relationship with your supplier partner is important. Okay, in 2018, uh, we were given an opportunity to go over to Zhuhai. Okay, this time round was representing, uh, okay, this time round was actually under Commonwealth Alliance of Young Entrepreneurs Asia. And uh, same thing, it was a China ASEAN thingy. And we went over there to explore the Zhuhai market as well. So I actually visited the salons and then look at their technology solution out there in the market. And we think we do have a chance to get into China, but we will need to customize quite a bit to get into China as well, okay? And uh, we held a workshop for uh, Northeast Skill Center, Assam, India. Okay, that was actually something that IT College East actually uh, asked us to see if we are av available to do that because they do have a, a engagement with the India counterpart to provide some education services for their hair beauty salon uh, courses and stuff like that to train up their trainers. Yeah, so we actually did this kind of workshops for them. And um, very much a blast over here in 2018, we also went over to Wuhan itself, okay? So there was a tech innovation Wuhan where we actually, uh, there was a problem statement given by one of our existing partner right now, okay, called Ho Feng Huang. They actually give us a problem statement that is addressing to the hair beauty salon market itself. We went on to pitch and we won some award over there as well. Then in 2019, we went over to Suzhou. This time around was uh, ASTAR actually expanded over to Suzhou. That's a ASTAR partnership center. So we went on to, to, to went over to Suzhou to do a Kao Cha, kind of like understanding the Suzhou market itself. And very helpful, uh, very blessed that uh, the Suzhou uh, counterparts actually helped us to arrange a visit to the neighborhood center, which allowed us to talk to three to six hair salons over there. And then we managed to, to talk to them, showcase our technology and ask them for their feedback. And in fact, did a ground visit to the salons to understand the software that they are using over there as well. Then um, there was also another event for Chongqing. This was the Smart China Expo in, in which uh, Singapore actually sent quite a bit of uh, task force over there. We, we went on and we applied and we won the third prize uh, award as well. As well for um, cloud-based uh, big data technology application and stuff like that. So um, pretty much, uh, very much appreciated. In fact, there was some price money, which is helpful to, to, to us as well. 
Okay, then following which uh, went on to ASEAN Bangkok. So this was some, uh, some ASEAN entrepreneur exchange for the ASEAN uh, leaders itself. So um, pretty much very interesting because uh, before you go over there, Singapore Business Federation has to kind of like uh, shortlist you, nominate you, and then after that, they have to verify what good to say and stuff like that before you can actually go on stage. So um, yeah, so I think it will be interesting because by the time if you really start representing Singapore, there's actually a lot of things that you need to take into consideration because uh, what you say and how you say it appearing on stage is very important because it represents Singapore. Yeah. Okay, and in 2018, we managed to sign an MOU with our Ho Fong Huang partner and we wanted to get over to, in 2019 itself, and we wanted to get, get on to Wuhan to license our technology officially over there to test out the market itself. Okay, but sadly that was in November. Okay, and uh, I think about two to three weeks later after I come back, that was the COVID situation happens already. Okay, and in 2020, we have to deal with COVID-19. In fact, a lot of the salons are pretty much uh, uh, affected for a few months. And after that, their sales get back. Okay, but they were asked to close their, their, their doors itself. And for that month of May itself, we actually didn't charge them any subscription service charges for them. Yeah, but to our surprise, in June, their sales actually doubled because it was a pent up demand. People still go and cut hair after that. Okay, and they still want, prefer to do some styling services. And in 2020, I actually joined Reaper to Wave in January. And then uh, I also take on a sideline as a grab food rider, as and when, part time, doing for fun. Yeah, to supplement my additional income. Because right now I'm looking into uh, settling down to form my own uh, family unit as well. So needed to, to earn more income already, yeah. Okay, so overall, I just wanted to, to share with you some of the things that, uh, that is important as a, as a founder, as an entrepreneur. First thing is uh, it takes courage. Okay, what it means is uh, you need to know how society views you, your family views you, okay? And then you are also looking at the failure that is potentially lying in front of you. And it takes a lot of courage to overcome them. Okay, and I'm not too sure for you. Uh, is there anyone in the audience over here, right? You all have fear of public speaking as well? Any of you here? Wow, there's quite a number. Whoa. Right. Mm, yes. Okay. Okay, it, it's normal for that, right? So um, not everybody uh, feels comfortable in front of cameras. Not everybody feels comfortable in front of a large audience as well. Usually you are comfortable with, let's say, a small group, like one-to-one, -one, you know, a few friends, you can talk and stuff like that. Or ask you to present in front of a group of people, it takes courage as well. So you need to overcome certain fear. So I would say that being an entrepreneur, it takes courage to take the first step. And you know there are certain things that you're lacking and you need to overcome that. Okay, and uh, the next thing is it takes perseverance. Okay, what it means is um, maybe the first prototype or the first product that you launch, right? It doesn't work because you have certain assumptions that it should work, right? But usually by the time you reach us into the market, it doesn't work. Okay, and at this point in time, do you give up? Or do you try to modify, customize or change it or go back to our drawing block? and then we work what you want to build, okay? And these kind of things actually takes a lot of perseverance from you as well, okay? And uh, the next thing that comes into place is it takes willingness to change, okay? So what it means is that um, when things don't work, you need to understand why it doesn't work, okay? And you need to change your approach already. Okay, or you need to change uh, certain features or you need to change the way how you, how you position your product or you need to change the pricing. 
Okay, but don't change for the for just immediately when people tell you it doesn't work, right? You need to understand why people tell you it doesn't work. And uh, different people has got different perspectives and opinions as well. So you need to go and find it, find out more deeper, but be willing to change when it comes, you make a conclusion that there needs to be a change. You need to change as well. Okay, and it takes learning whatever it takes. Okay, because as an entrepreneur, as a founder, uh, you probably lack a lot of skill sets, right? And you may not have a lot of resources to hire a lot of other people as well to complement your skill sets. So um, the only way out is you learn whatever that is needed and whatever that it takes. Okay, even if it means calling your technical advisor from A star I square R on a Saturday or Sunday or even at night, or even if they give you a Chinese PhD research paper, you read it, understand the formulas and ask why, and you learned it and then you improvise from there. Okay, it takes quite a bit of strategizing. You need to learn how to stand on the shoulders of giants. There are certain doors that can only be opened by certain group of people or certain group of entities. So if you're a small startup, you can't do that, right? But you need to learn how to stand on the shoulders of giant. So for example, we stood on the shoulders of A-Star, we stood on the shoulders of uh, SMU, we stood on the shoulders of Microsoft, we stood on the shoulders of uh, Samsung, and together with them, we look bigger and more possible as well. So in this case, over here at SUSS, uh, you all have SUSS where you can start from. Okay, so learn about strategizing your move as well. And uh, it takes resourcefulness. Okay, how can you borrow other people's resources? Okay, but in, in retrospect, right, is you also need to provide something of equal value to them as well. Okay, so always think about uh, how can you achieve a win-win situation together with your partners and suppliers? Okay, and if you can do that, you can use their resources. Okay, and it takes execution. You need to execute. Okay, things don't stay, uh, things won't happen if it stays on paper, or it won't, it won't happen if it's a pure concept. You need to execute the concept in order for something to happen. If not, then everything is just uh, empty words itself. Okay, and last but not least, is really about uh, balancing your personal uh, expenses and income. Okay. And you have all these things that's going on behind uh, your mind, okay, where you have to take care of your personal matters as well. But at the same time, as a founder, you have to constantly think about the startup, okay? And the startup will include how do you get more revenue? How can you create more revenue streams? And how can you consistently get the revenue that you need in order to pay off your bills, your salary, your costs, and stuff like that, in order to justify you are going to create a profit, then and only with profit can you remain sustainable. Okay, you can't be making losses or keep on burning investor money. Okay, you need to make profit to become a sustainable business itself. Okay, and that takes a lot of thinking and effort. Okay, so as a founder, you need to balance both your own personal matters as well as the startup itself. Okay, so these are some of the cool things that we managed to get. So uh, in this startup entrepreneurship journey, you will get to meet a lot of uh, cool people and then get to present your stuff also to them and then hear their opinions. Yeah, I think that's all from my side. I'll pass on to the next speaker. Thank you, Siming. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left. Nonetheless, uh, it has been one and a half hours now. I suggest we have a quick bio break. I at least need one. <laughs> and um, be back in, let's say, five minutes. Is that okay with the organizers? Yes, definitely. So, uh, yeah, we can all break for five minutes and we can come back by 8.29. Perfect, yeah. Perfect. See you guys back. Thank you.
829. Can I have a signal that everyone is back? Maybe just type a one in the chat to show me that you are back. All right, great. Okay, I see majority of you are back. Right, then uh, I think next up we have Helga uh, who will be sharing more. So uh, back to you, Helga. Thank you. Yeah, so we have two more uh, topics that we wanted to cover. One is a very quick intro to um, the company I work for, Emerald Technology Ventures, and then followed by what we do in terms of um, uh, a digital water program, which will be covered by Abel. And then we still hope to have some time for Q&A. Um, yeah, we will move fast. Okay, quickly about uh, Emerald Technology Ventures. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen uh, since I don't see any, exactly. Thanks for the nod. Um, so here's some key facts about us. We have been around for two decades. Um, we're present in uh, Switzerland, Canada, and uh, now Singapore, not only via the incubator, but we're actually currently launching our venture capital office there as well. Um, we are an open innovation partner uh, to 27 multinational corporations. I get to that uh, in a bit. We have invested by now, it's actually more than 67 and about 70 uh, companies over the years, um, mostly in Europe and North America, but also some in Australia and Israel. Uh, you see the incubator on the bottom right that, we, that I introduced earlier. And next to our venture capital activities, we also run uh, a loan guarantee program for the Swiss government, which is uh, called the, the Swiss Technology Fund, which supports companies that have, an, uh, have a technology that have a positive impact on uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, that's in a nutshell who we are. In terms of our investment activities, we focus on industrial innovation that address long-term trends both in terms of what we call a market pull, sort of uh, big drivers that you're all aware of, like climate change, um, the need to feed the planet uh, with a growing number of uh, people on it, urbanization, aging infrastructure, and so on. The sharing economy is a big topic as well. And um, on the other side, the what we call the innovation push or the technology push, that we have more and more sensor capabilities for more and more data. We have uh, what people in general refer to as artificial intelligence, anything of kind of smart decision support or even aut autonomy, uh, automated decision making um, um, supported by computers. Um, we have um, also new business models, not just technologies. And obviously, as you know, with the 3D manufacturing, 3D printing capabilities, we also have novel manufacturing uh, opportunities. So within that landscape, we actually, as Emerald, invest across a number of different verticals and technology platforms. So you see here some resource verticals. Water is one of them, but really not all. Um, we look at materials, we look at oil and gas and power, and then we have some more uh, verticals that we call application verticals, like mobility, the built environment, um, food and ag, electronics, and then we obviously do consider also production and logistics as well as environment and recycling. And across all these areas, you basically have um, different technology approaches, if you will. So Materials play a role um, in mobility as well as in the water space, right? It's advanced membrane filtration technology and in mobility, it could be a new, uh, new composite materials uh, based on the required light weight of vehicles as they become electric. The same is true for components and systems and uh, software and services. So this is basically the investment universe in which we're active. Um, and I mentioned earlier, next to being an investor, we're actually also an open innovation partner. Um, I'm not sure if all of you have heard about this term before. What it basically stands for is um, that instead of only looking inside 
your fans, if you are a major multinational corporate, just looking at your own R&D and believing that that's the best and the most important uh, R&D that, that uh, is relevant for you as a company. That's the contrary of open innovation. Open innovation also likes to look outside what's happening around me and how can I connect to that innovation that's happening around me and leverage it. It can, doesn't necessarily mean I need to acquire different businesses, but I should first of all learn from it and then potentially collaborate. And uh, to achieve that, there are different kind of tools that multinationals can use. And we are one of the tools, if you will, um, because we see currently about 1,500 startups every year in the areas that I indicated just previously. And we only invest in about five per year. So all the rest of the companies, it does not mean that they're not worth anything, that there is no value in actually looking into them. Uh, it's just an investment decision on our end, uh, which has many different dimensions to it. So we're happy to independent, independently, whether we actually invest ourselves or not, connect those startups with industrial corporations. So that's, that's what we do. And obviously we are, we're even more um, interested to do so once we do invest, but it's not limited to that. And here you see an overview of these corporates that are in our industrial innovation fund that we provide these services to. And obviously it's also true in the other direction. Um, as Seming just mentioned is him in his presentation, as a startup, you want to stand on the shoulders of some of these giants in terms of credibility, but then also in terms of reaching the markets. Um, and sometimes they can actually do the manufacturing for you, um, joint product development, all sorts of things, not just a channel to market, but other dimensions that are relevant for your business as well. On the water side, just to make the link again to Ripple to Wave, um, we have been uh, selective uh, but quite successful in uh, investing in the water space, uh, relatively global, uh, given that we have primarily invested in North America and Europe so far across all of our different segments. In water, we actually also went all the way to Australia. You see here, if you just look at the images, it sounds like water is one sector, but uh, you see here membrane technology on the left, which is about filtration which has uh, its own markets in terms of industrial and municipal uh, water treatment. Then you have irrigation, uh, which again is very, very different. It's, uh, it can be for agriculture, or in the case of HydroPoint, it's actually for commercial landscapes or public buildings. Then the next images again indicate uh, condition assessment tools of pipes. Uh, you may know that the pipes in the grounds are very expensive. Um, expensive to replace, although the know-how about their condition is relatively limited or has been up, up to uh, some recent years. So there are companies that offer tools that give you insights how, how they, in which condition they actually are before you try, uh, decide to spend a lot of money to replace them. And then last but not least, you see uh, some companies offer again some more um, um, computer-added uh, solutions to the to the space as well and as i mentioned previously we have been successful in exiting some of those so one was a membrane company uh, to bsf then this condition assessment uh, solution sold uh, first of all it was on the on the toronto stock exchange and then it was acquired by xylem and lately uh, our australian company offering a software platform for decision support and planning your infrastructure was acquired by one of the largest water companies globally called Suez. And the biggest latest news from our end on the waterfront, oops, sorry, uh, is really that we launched this new dedicated waterfront. So far we invested in all of the areas that I indicated earlier out of one single fund. And now uh, we actually have a dedicated one for water. I mentioned uh, Temasek, who probably most of you know, uh, as is a cornerstone investor. The other investors are um, 
Ski on Water uh, from Germany, Ecolab, uh, headquartered in the US, but a global company, and Microsoft. And Microsoft is obviously interesting because on the one hand, they just committed to reduce their own water footprint via their own operations, including their data centers that require a lot of cooling. But it's also interesting in terms of being a partner to some of the startups that we invest in, in terms of providing uh, AI or digital, generally speaking, digital solutions to the water space. And that um, brings me to our last presentation, which will be covered by Abel. Uh, digital water is a big theme. Uh, we have been successfully investing in it. We see uh, good margins, good scalability in the, these businesses, and all of that related to providing good value to the water industry because of the complexities that you very often find in, in water industries like distribution networks and so on. Unfortunately, though, we didn't find a lot of IP yet um, that has been generated in, in, uh, in Singapore, or maybe there is, but nobody is taking it to the commercial stage, which is why it was one of the trigger points for us to embark on the program that Ibel is uh, going to present right now. Okay, Ibel. 